All right, everyone, so for our first activity here regarding SEO, we're going to do this exercise where you might have done a version of it, but we're going to look at it with a new eye. So what I want you to do is, on your computer, go ahead and load one of the web browsers. You might already have a web browser open. Just open up any web browser you like. We've got all the popular ones here. So I'm going to go with Google Chrome. And then I'm going to go to the website, this little website that you might have heard about called Google.com. Let's go to Google.com. Google, of course, is the search engine that's been around approximately 15 years or so. Um, the, one of the biggest and most famous um, websites. The purpose of the website is to give you results when you search for something. It's a search engine. It's not the only search engine. It's not the first search engine, but it's the biggest search engine at the moment. What we'll do here is we'll do a, a Google search. Let's search for your name as you usually spell it. So if you are known as William Jefferson Clinton, uh, more likely you're known as Bill Clinton. So if you're searching for, let's search for yourself as you, as you are most commonly known. This obviously has the nomenclature. You're Googling yourself. But we're, what we're doing is we're searching uh, for ourselves. We're checking here, what does Google know about us, know about me, for example. It says that there are 26 million results right here. There's some pictures, there's a call-out box, your results may look different, and then there's results. The number one result is Victor Campos, the actor. That's not me. I was not born in 1935. The next result is me. There's my LinkedIn profile. So the second result is one of my links. The third result is also another one of mine. It's my link to my professor's account. The next result is not me. That's not my Facebook. The next result is another one of mine. That's one of my websites. And then there's a lawyer. That's not me. I'm not a lawyer. And then there's some sort of video. That's not mine. Then there's another link which is mine and then another one which is mine. So out of 10 slots I've got like six or seven of them, and um, I want you to make a note here, brandyourself.com. This is a reputation management website. If you yourself are one of the um, selling points, let's say, of your company, you're going to need to look into these reputation management websites. If I'm a lawyer, obviously, I'm the, pr I'm the product. If I'm, uh, if I'm the painter selling my paintings, I'm part of the, the product. If I'm yet another employee at um, Qualcomm, you know, I'm not really the front-facing aspect of Qualcomm. I'm, a, I'm just another employee in Qualcomm. But if I am such an integral part of my company, it behooves you to educate yourself about the reputation management websites that are out there. If you create a free profile at brandyourself.com that could serve the purpose as we're seeing here, yet another positive link that is of me to take up those 10 slots of all the millions of Victor Campuses in the world. BrandYourself.com offers you free and paid services. It's not the only one. There's also AboutMe.com and there's also Reputation.com. Those companies are there trying to help you put the best foot forward, your best foot forward, if you value your name as part of your brand out there. So brandyourself.com, aboutme.com, and reputation.com. They have free and they have paid services. You can get by with most of the free things. And I do recommend it. I don't work for them or anything. I just recommend it and I like to give out the best information. So this kind of search here on Google, uh, we want to see what does Google know about this person, this name. Um, we're also going to be focusing in this class on Google and the second biggest search engine, Bing. We're going to be focusing on both of those search engines to optimize to reach the most people. Combined, 
they have like 90% market share. Google used to have, a few years ago, about 80% uh, market share. Now it's, a, it's in more in the 60% range. Even though it's still the biggest search engine, the number one go-to for millions and millions of people, it's dropped to about in the 60% range. Bing, at one point, of course, was at 0%, and now it's at about 20%. As one increases, perhaps the other is increasing. And I can show you various statistics and such to show you that, that as Bing um, extends more of its reach and popularity, it comes at the cost of Google. Now, I don't think that one day Bing will be so big that we'll be, that we'll be saying, oh, you don't know that? Go Bing it. I don't think we're going to do that. <coughs> I think we're still going to be using the nomenclature of Google it rather than Bing it. I don't think we'll get to that point. But I do see that this alternative search engine, the second place search engine, is increasing in market share. And so it would behoove us to take advantage of that population that is using Bing. You might never have heard of it. You might never have used it. You might not know anyone that has used it or heard of it, but hundreds of millions of people globally and locally have heard of it and do use it. So we'll be talking about both of those search engines to optimize for them. That's why I'm not really going to be generic and say, let's check the Google search. Let's Google it. Let's optimize for Google. I'm going to say, let's do, let's do a search. Let's look at the search engine results. Let's optimize for search engines. I'm not going to specifically say a particular search engine because there are more than one. I want to optimize for the two big ones. Yahoo's still around, and at one point it was probably around 90% market share when the web was much younger. Well, that's been a while now. Yahoo doesn't have the same sort of reach that it used to have. Okay. I, the, the thing. Um, so Yahoo doesn't have the same sort of reach that it used to have, and Yahoo knows that. So what Yahoo has are contracts, actually, with Bing and with Google to show results from Bing and Google on Yahoo. So if we optimize for Bing and, and, and Google, we're also reaching the people that are using Yahoo. On that note, I'm going to open another web browser here. I'm going to leave Google open for a moment and open another web browser or another tab if you'd like. But I'm going to switch over to another web browser and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to search my name, but this time on Bing because I want to see, is there a difference? So open another window or another web browser and let's go to bing.com. B-I-N-G, bing.com. Both Google Search and Bing Search are in the business of providing you results of your queries. You're looking for something online. Bing and Google both feel they can give you the best result. If you think of them as a company, the Bing company, the Google company, the product is a relevant page of results. If I'm searching for dentists, uh, Bing and Google will tell me this is the best result for various reasons, and those reasons are the algorithm. Bing and Google have an algorithm, a, a software, a technique that they both browse the same web, the same websites. But for various reasons, they will tell you this is the better result, number one, number two, number three, number 99. Obviously very different when you visit it. You've got here, whereas Google is a very Spartan layout, plain white background, and then their multicolored logo. Bing here has um, a picture of the day, and news items and such, but still it's about search. So again, I'm going to search for my name. Go ahead and search your name as you are most known on Bing. Google told me that there were about 26 million results, and Bing tells me that there are about 5 million results. Again, they're both looking at the same web, everything on the internet, but they're presenting things in different ways. Bing thinks, yeah, here's 5 million results that you might be interested in, not 24 million to get bogged down in. 
the results page looks similar. The SERP, search engine results page, the SERP looks similar in that there's results. There might be a call out box on the side. There might be pictures. Layout is very similar, but the results are probably a bit different. Google shows an Internet Movie Database link as number one. So does Bing, but Bing also shows quick data right here. That Victor Campos was born in 1935, January. I'm not 80 years old, but I was born in January. That's not me. Second result is LinkedIn, but it's not my LinkedIn. It's the top 25 Victor Campos's on LinkedIn. Pictures, and look at that. Here I am right there. My picture didn't show up on Google for various reasons. The algorithm, the software that Google runs, didn't think it was important to show a picture of that Victor. But on this one here, I'm there and others. The next result um, is another uh, Victor Campos on LinkedIn. Oh, and then actually my LinkedIn is right there. It's a little bit lower, fourth place instead of second. But notice also it gives a little bit more data. Right away my job title and such. Director of Technology of PMB Interactive, Internet Provider 85 Connections. And there's something called PQ.com. I think this is one of these sort of like up-and-coming directory sites that tries to be like the next yellow pages. So apparently um, Victor Campos is on it. I don't know if it's me, but Victor Campos is there. TV Guide result. White pages. And then my profile at Southwestern College. So a few less results of myself on Bing but presented in different ways. When you did your Google search, how many of you found some links that you were not expecting? Okay. When you did the Bing search, how many of you found results that you weren't expecting? Were there any results on Bing that didn't show up on Google? So we might see a couple of different results with these competing search engines. Let's do this. I'll go back to Google, do another Google search. And this time I'll search for the name of my company. So if you've got a company, search for the name of your company, but search for it very basically, just the name of your company, not the, not the web address or not what you do, just a very basic search for the name of your company. If you don't have a company, you can just put mine or anything else if you'd like. And so if I search for the name of my company, I get a page of results just like everyone in the world does. And look at that, number one. I'm number one on Google. This is a false. This is a trick question. Of course I'm number one. I'm searching exactly for my company. The point of this search is to see what does Google know about my company. So number one result is my company. It shows it was the, the last blog post was on October 8th. I admit we need to update that. Then we've got results for Yelp with these five stars. We've got this result on Facebook. There's our Twitter. There's our LinkedIn. There's our Android apps and YouTube videos. There's something called alignable.com. That one's a new result that's come up recently. I don't know what that is, but it's probably some sort of directory listing site. And then MapQuest. And then, of course, pages and pages of results. Apparently, 356,000 results. The point of this false search is to see that this is SEO and SEM in action. SEO, search engine optimization, as I said earlier, basically is what you do on your website. And SEM is what you do outside of your website, search engine marketing. What are you doing outside of your website? Are you also on Yelp and Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat and YouTube and all of those ancillary platforms? Do you also have a blog? What are you doing besides just your website? Because now having the website is the minimum. It used to be a few years ago. That would be nice to have a website. Now that's the minimum. Now that many more people have a website as a minimum, the new minimum is, are you also on Yelp or Facebook or whatever other extra platform? And that's the SEM part, search engine marketing. I'm going to compare that same search in Bing. 
search for the name of my company, exactly the same on Bing. Number one result again is my company, as I would expect it, but look at how different it is. Bing is showing deep links. Bing is showing links directly to, for example, the portfolio. What companies have, has this company worked with, and do I want to hire them based on the portfolio? What kind of social media do they run? What's the graphic design like about them? Great, request a quote. So notice Bing is being much more helpful to my company and contact information right there. Google doesn't provide that. It says, here's the company, click it and go find out. Bing is providing it right on the home page of a search. Also, it's putting over here this very cool call-out box that stands out that says, look at these great reviews from Yelp. So we should be seeing that the search engines give us different results, either different links or present differently. It lists Twitter also just like Google, but it shows it in, in second place rather than in uh, fourth place like Google. And it also shows the stats of the number of followers and tweets and such. There's also um, the services page that's taking a, taking a slot here directly to guide people to the services. There's the Yelp account again with the, the stats and the phone number. There's the Facebook result just like Google, but it also shows the rating on Facebook because you can rate companies on Facebook. Facebook is trying to be what Yelp is. Facebook's trying to do what every company is. They're trying to do a little bit of every company. And one of them is ratings. There's our LinkedIn, there's our Google+. And notice this, this is one result that is not on Google at all. On Google, we've got our YouTube channel. And on Bing, I don't see Google, but I see the other video sharing site, Vimeo. YouTube is the big famous one, but there's also Vimeo. That would be a, the second uh, biggest video site, Vimeo. And you might say, well, why, why is that? Why, why doesn't it also show YouTube? One possible reason, uh, YouTube. Who owns YouTube? Google. Google owns YouTube, and Google company owns Google Search. And so it's pretty convenient to then put a Google result on the Google result page. Bing is owned by Microsoft. Microsoft doesn't own Vimeo, to my knowledge, but they're uh, providing a link to a, a competitive and alternative video sharing site. So we should be seeing that we're getting different results from the two search engines. And I said, of course, Google is the big one, 60% market share. That's the one that's so ingrained in us, it's become a generic word. Google it. When actually people should be saying search it, because that's not the only search engine. Google's not the only search engine. But the name has become so ingrained and perhaps genericized in a way that uh, extreme case would be that Google actually loses their trademark on Google, such as Kleenex. Um, nowadays you would say, oh, I've got a runny nose, hand me a Kleenex, rather than hand me a facial tissue. Kleenex is a, is a brand of facial tissue, but it's so ingrained, genericized, that they're synonymous. We've got some trash that we're going to throw away. Let's go out and throw it away in the dumpster. Dumpster is actually a trademarked name of an outdoor covered trash receptacle. We don't say outdoor covered trash receptacle, we say dumpster. Now the same thing perhaps with Google search. Google it, when we mean search it. But there's more than one search engine. There's of course Google, there's Bing, there's Yahoo, AOL, Ask Jeeves, all of those. Those are still around, but the biggest ones, Google and Bing. And as I said, Google is decreasing in market share, and Bing is increasing. Possible reasons for that. Uh, iPhone or uh, Apple used to have a contract with Google. When you got a brand new iPhone or a brand new Mac and you did a search, you would get Google results. The contract ran out. And guess who Apple then started a new contract with? 
Microsoft, Bing. So now Apple has the contract with Bing to get results when people do the Siri thing and ask it, what's a good restaurant around here? They're going to get Bing results. People can, of course, change it back to Google, and people do. But people oftentimes don't care. They just want answers. Um, people don't notice or don't care oftentimes some of these details. They just want a result of, I need a plumber now. And if it comes out, out of a Yahoo search, I don't care. This is the best result I want it. Out of a Bing search, out of a Google search. So uh, iPhone market is very big. Uh, the, the Apple market is, is pretty sizable. And they've partnered now with Microsoft to pull results up rather than Google. So that's hurting Google uh, traffic. Um, my uh, friend has a, a Prius. And so um, there's this cool panel, uh, a touch panel on her dashboard, and it's got uh, maps and all of that, and a, and a search, internet search. I, I clicked it to see what it had, and it said powered by Bing. So her Prius, at least, I don't know if they all do, but that car has a search engine built in, and it's Bing. If you're going to buy a new computer off the shelf, a Windows computer, Windows is made by what company? Microsoft. Microsoft owns Bing. So when you get a brand new Windows computer, the default search is also Bing. And right now, they've just announced, Microsoft has announced that the newest Windows, Windows 10, has reached 200 million users, faster than the previous versions of Windows, actually. So um, built-in Bing search on Windows 10, built-in on Windows 8. Windows 7. So if you buy a brand new computer, it'll have Bing search built in, and people, of course, right away then change it if they want to, but still hundreds of millions of people are using and continue to use uh, Bing, and as, as I said, it, a few years ago, months ago, it was 14% market share, 16% market share. One of the latest statistics is about 20% market share. That's why it behooves us. We still also want to target and optimize and think about Bing. The good news is we're not going to really need to have a big complicated game plan that is different for both search engines. We can apply the same concepts basically to both. Um, and that's why I said next week bring your login information so we can connect the search engines directly to your website to, um, to have them um, index your site to have them find your site a lot easier. Because the search engines send out their spiders 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, all year long, sending out these little apps, these little spiders, crawling the web, looking for every website, anything new on the web, following this link and following that link, and indexing it all, making a catalog of it all. So that when I type in here, um, uh, dentist, I get results. And so if we optimize for both, we will reach more, more people. Let's do another search. I'll go back to Google. This time, let's search for the keyword that your company is about. Let's not get too complicated yet. You might be a, a savvy person that knows the tricks, perhaps, about how to search a little bit more effectively. I'm going to do a classic kind of search where I'm simply going to search for web design. I'm not going to put in a location or something like affordable web design, just very basic web design. My company, one of the things we do is web design. So I want to search here, web design. And Google very helpfully tells me I get 1.6 billion results. And then it tells me here's all your results. And it gives me a nice map. San Diego, how did it know I'm in San Diego? I'll mention why in a moment. But here's the results that Google thinks are the best results in web design. Let me compare that with Bing. Bing thinks there are actually 2 billion results I might be interested in. And different results here, and uh, I don't see a map like, like over on Google, but I do see a, a call-out box here with a person, with a company's phone number and such right away. So if I look at the Google result, sometimes even if you search the exact same thing that I do, you might not get the exact result. Because again, the algorithm for the search engines can vary for a variety of reasons. 
but just to break down my results here, I get a page of, I get, I get the SERP, and I get these page, I get these results, and then I get the number one result here from WebsiteBuilderTop10.com, Business Website Design MoPro, web design only $497, build your site, other results, WebInertia.com, some maps, it looks like a map of an infestation, but actually it's just a map of web designers, which is just as bad. So you get all of these results here, and then map, directions and such, and star ratings. Just by looking at it here, if I, if I kind of back up a bit like this, I've got these results, and those results, and these results. Out of just this screen here, which of these entices you more, maybe to, to click and find out more? Maybe the ones with the nice picture and rating and directions and such. I want that. I want to get featured like that. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how I can be featured and get my star ratings. And yeah, these people are featured here, but they've got 4.9 stars and these don't have a star rating. I might be more inclined to give them a call. Sometimes these results pages at the top they have a they have a website and for for some segment of society that perhaps isn't as web savvy as you might think that literally the top result is the best they might see these pages and say I'm gonna click the first one because it's the first one and it's the best but if you're a bit more of a savvy web user perhaps you know that well that's an ad they paid for that. They might not be the best. Just because they paid for it doesn't mean they're the best. And you might be right. Notice these are listed as ad. And eventually there's some that don't have listing as an ad. These would be called the organic search results. These websites are doing techniques that are different than the techniques of these that appear in the ad section because SEO um, could be done the easy way or the hard way. Raise your hand if you'd like it to do it the easy way. Okay now take your hand and reach into your wallet and take your credit card out because the easy way is the paid way. That's what these companies have done. They've paid the placement. They've paid per click, PPC. That's one of the big buzzwords in SEO, PPC, pay per click. They've paid some amount of money. Let me just throw out a number, $100. Let's say Website Builder Top 10 paid $100 to be number one. Well, okay, then MoPro can pay $105, and they'll be number one. So then Website Builder pays $120, now they're number one. But then BuildYourSite.com pays $300, now they're number one. So you're seeing it's an ever-present ever arms race, this whole PPC. You're going to pay some amount of money, your budget's going to deplete, someone else is going to pay more, now they're number one even though you spent $500. So PPC, that's the easy way you pay for placement and such, but I'm not going to talk really at all about that in this class. I'm going to be talking about the hard way. I'm going to be talking about the way that's a little longer but builds a better foundation. Because as soon as the budget runs out for these guys, they start to plummet. Because they're no longer paying. Just like that ad on the highway that someone paid for for this month, as soon as the money runs out for that ad, they take it down. Is someone else ready to put that ad up? Same thing here. How effective do you put on the top of the ad here? Is it many people watching this? What's a maximum way? Many people, because look at the results, 1.6 billion results, lots of people. So it's very competitive. They must have paid a lot of money. Uh, we can look up somewhere perhaps how much they spent. And it is pay-per-click. It is based on, I'm buying this, these keywords. I'm buying the keyword web design. And so when I use that, it costs me every time someone clicks on it. So that's why I'm saying I don't talk too much in these classes about pay-per-click because it can get very expensive. I'm going to talk about the free method, which is organic, which is what these people have down here. BopDesign.com, JacobTyler.com. But notice in the organic section, 
here's a web company, here's a web company, here's Yelp, a directory of web companies, and then an article on Wikipedia. So these valuable slots that could have been taken up by real <coughs> companies are taken up by other, other things such as Yelp and what, what is the definition of web design. And we've got tinyfrog.com, top 50 web designers in San Diego, so a directory listing. Then we've got some news. We've got Ash Web Studio, another real company. And then we've got webdesignsolutions.com. Ten spaces. And three or four of them are taken up by non-companies. You're not going to knock out of the position Wikipedia, one of the most popular websites in the world. You're not going to knock that out. You're not going to knock Yelp out of that spot either, one of the most popular websites in the world. So now you've got a much smaller, finite amount of space to rank. That's what this class is about. How do we get into the organic results? It's the longer way, it's the harder way, but it builds a better foundation than these over here that when their money runs out, so does their placement. I'll always use the, the ones exactly exactly you and many people I don't know if most people but many people on the other side of it there are many people that don't feel like that and say yeah I'm gonna go with these guys and that's valuable I'm not saying PPC and such is bad it is valuable especially if we're starting from zero if we have a brand new website, no traffic at all and such, I can budget $20 and start to get a little bit of traction. Then I engage much more in the organic, and some paid, some organic is going to be better than only organic, uh, only paid. Um, so my company does that. We do mostly the organic, but we do the PPC stuff, the paid stuff, when necessary. It's not a dirty word. It's not a trick. It's not spam. It does work if you do it smartly. Again, I don't quite talk about that in this class because we have, uh, we, we can talk the whole four weeks or more just on organic SEO. And same thing goes with Bing. If I go back to Bing, there's going to be there's going to be ads, but at the moment. I don't quite like that they don't make it that obvious that they're ads. The ad marker in Google is yellow and noticeable here. It's right there. Did you even notice there was an ad? You might think you might not notice it, and a lot of people don't. And they might think, okay, I'll go with Wix.com. Design a website for free. That's what I like, and it's got four stars. It must be the best. With hundreds of free templates. Well, they paid for that. They paid to be number one and with all of these deep links and such. And it works for them really well. Whatever, if they spent $1,000 on it, they're probably making $10,000 from that payment, the return on investment. <coughs> Skipping the ads. Again, it's not as obvious. There's a little line here. Then the organic stuff appears. Webdesign.org. Tutorials and articles. So not a real company is number one. It's a sort of do-it-yourself. Then Jacob Tyler, number two. Web.com for your small business web design. Then we've got local results. It knows that I'm in San Diego, so it says these companies are nearby. And this is pretty ironic. Bing result page is giving me a result of the official Google web designer manual. So I'll give this to you in a handout. But basically, Google publishes a manual, so does Bing, that says these are the do's and don'ts for Google search and Bing. These are the do's and don'ts for Bing search. And I just think it's ironic that Bing is showing a result from the competitor. But the next one is that also that Wikipedia article taking up a valuable spot. About.com to do it yourself. Bunch of ads. And then the page ends. So there's really one or two real companies. Uh, well, there's the local also. Um, there's not that many real companies. There's more of sort of, sort of do-it-yourself. And when we did this kind of search, I'm, I'm showing you here, you're going to be a needle in a haystack. Uh, it's important, and we'll talk about keywords on a website. And the problem is that again the search engines change their techniques all the time so the technique of keywords on a website has evolved I'll teach you the latest version of it of course but in the old days that was enough 
if I, if I had my keyword web design all over my website, like on my domain name, victorwebdesign.com, if I had it in my logo, if I had it on the first paragraph, if I had it in the footer, if I had that keyword all over my site, the search engines where they were more primitive would analyze your site and say, this site, site must be about web design, let's rank them really well. Well, if we do that, and we're the good guys, the bad guys can do that too. The spammers can do that too, and put web design a thousand times on their site. And the old algorithm would, wasn't smart enough, and they say, great, that site must be better than this site that only used it 20 times. But as the search engines got smarter and changed the rules, they say, well, that kind of keyword technique doesn't work anymore. And oftentimes, techniques that didn't used to work before, because they've been corrupted by the spammers now, actually hurt you. So there's plenty of books out there written three, four years ago that maybe aren't so relevant anymore because these things change. I have a recommendation in my syllabus for a book, but it's the latest version, and even that um, changes by the time they publish a new edition. So this kind of search, you're going to be a needle in a haystack. More and more people are doing this kind of search right here. What's a good taco shop nearby? It said, here are 10 taco shops nearby with good reviews. So I asked it a natural question, like a person. I asked it about a taco shop nearby. And it knows because of GPS and such where I am, and it gives me results. Number one result, uh, Lupe's Taco Shop. It's got four stars, 211 reviews on Yelp. El Esmeralda's Taco Shop, it's less than a mile away, four stars, La Fuente Mexican Food, four stars, 89 reviews, etc. So this is the kind of search more and more people are doing, not literally asking the phone, but on the search engine here, you're probably not going to be uh, getting good results with simply searching web design. You'll probably search for affordable web design for restaurants in San Diego as more and more of us use the web and get frustrated with very basic searches and get more detailed that's what we need to think about not simply having the keyword web design on our site but being a great representation of this collection of keywords which is known as the long tail keyword strategy the long tail keyword I'll explain what that means in a moment but the basics of it is more detailed, a more detailed search, a natural language search, like I asked my phone, and it gave me results that actually tap into Yelp to give me results. I asked it location, I asked for a good taco shop, and it's giving me nearby taco shops with good reviews. This one's a Bing search, actually. And so, here, uh, we have the ads, of course, restaurantsolutions.com. Restaurant websites are all we do. From Weebly, oops, from these other companies, and then we've got ads, then the real ones, affordablewebdesignsandiego.com, creativehouse.com, That's gravydesigns.com. Yelp still shows up. These articles and ads and stuff still show up. So this is what we're going to focus on in this class about being specific, finding the right audience, because we're not going to get found with web design, with uh, vegan restaurant, with um, realtor in Chula Vista. We need to be much more specific to find a target audience that really will care to search for us and hire us because this is the kind of search now that the search engines are moving toward. They keep changing the algorithm and you may have never done this kind of search but many 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 people are doing this kind of search and will continue to do so as we get used to for example asking our phone. You've got uh, Siri on the iPhone, you've got Cortana on a Windows phone, you've got Google Now on a Samsung Galaxy. They've all got this built in, the, the, the newer ones. You just ask it and it'll tap into a search engine, doesn't matter which one, Google, Bing, Yahoo, whatever, 
but it's going to tap into a search engine, give us results, and more and more traffic to websites are coming from these. The thing in your pocket instead of the thing on your desk. So we'll be talking about that. If your site isn't mobile friendly, that's a detriment. If your website is, is cumbersome on a phone, that nowadays is a negative. The search engines will penalize you for that. It used to be, it's nice if your site is optimized for mobile, now basically it's a requirement. So make a note of that. If your site is not mobile friendly, that will hurt your search engine results. So, oh, let me, let me explain why it's called the long tail. I'm going to draw a simple little graph. I'll put this graph in the network folder in a moment, uh, as well as other, other things that I'll give you. But I'm going to draw a simple x and y graph. On the left axis, up and down, is uh, frequency. On the horizontal, we have keyword. And in the middle, the graph looks like this. So to explain this, there's going to be some keyword that is used a lot on a website. One billion results. There's going to be some keyword, instead of seven, instead of one billion results, only seven million results. A billion is much larger than a million. But there's going to be some keyword over here that less people use, less SEO gurus, less websites. There's some keywords here that a lot of websites will use, and some over here that less websites will use. This is the long tail strategy. We need to figure out what are the keywords over here that less people are using to stand out from the rest of the needles in the haystack. You mean we're not using it as companies use it or not searches? Not people searching. Both. The company uses the keyword to put on their website, and the people use the keyword to find the company. So there are some that everyone is using, you're not going to get found. There are some that less people are using, you have a better chance of getting found. So that graph applies for both? Yeah. So that's what we'll be talking a lot about in this class, the long tail keyword, because this is the long tail here. If you further draw the graph, you will see a cow over here, and here's its tail. Just kidding, but it's the long tail. It's the long tail of it all. Down at that part of it, you find this audience. This applies to many other things, such as uh, the 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 explosion of ebooks and vanity publishing nowadays, where it used to be a publisher wouldn't publish your book unless you had a guarantee that you were going to reach whatever million people to buy and read the book. But nowadays with self-publishing and ebooks and all of that, you can make a good living reaching this audience down here instead of trying to reach this audience over here, like everyone else. For us in SEO, we can get better results trying to find our long tail keyword. And we'll have an activity and a handout and all of that stuff. Um, soon. Long tail keyword strategy. Let me show you uh, one more thing, then we'll take a break. Usually we take a break every every hour or so, and then at the end of the day, the last 30 minutes or so, we have an open lab where if you need individual help. But during the lecture, of course, you can raise your hand and I'll help you out whenever you want, especially when we get hands-on. If you fall behind a bit, raise your hand, I'll help you out. 
If you fall a little further behind, you can wait for the break every hour or so. If you fall a lot behind, you can wait for the end of the day. I help you out there. You can also help each other out, but the only thing is that I ask you to do it at a reasonable volume. Um, our voice travels easily here, of course, and as you're helping someone, you're probably distracting someone else. So if you do help each other, please keep it at a reasonable volume. I'll raise your hand or I'll help you out. But I'm going to show you one more thing, then we'll take the break. Uh, I'll show you an example of one of our clients. So as I said, I, I teach this stuff, but I also do it for a company. So if you want to check out this website, this client, akiestexcoco.com. So it's, uh, this is a website for a client who is a Mexican food restaurant. This is one of our full featured clients where basically we do everything for them. We do the photography, the logo, the web design, the text, the blogs, the social media, the SEO, all of that. And um, it works very well for them because they've actually been featured on Travel Channel and the Cooking Channel and written up on the Union Tribune and Rachel Ray voted their tacos best and all of that. Um, and they've they started in Tijuana, came to San Diego in 2008 or so, 10 I think, and then they uh, expanded to Los Angeles last year, and then uh, they're expanding eventually in about a year or so, perhaps also to Las Vegas, they're doing very well. Um, so part of that is because of the way that the owner is very savvy in knowing the value of investing in SEO and SEM. So let me break it down as this example here. This website, in total, is designed in WordPress. As I said earlier, I recommend WordPress. And I'm not saying it just because I, uh, my company really is good at WordPress. As I said, 25% of global websites use WordPress. It's a very popular, powerful software. One of the incentives of WordPress is its price. It's a very affordable zero dollars. You don't have to pay anything for WordPress. In, addition, uh, in contrast to other software like Dreamweaver or Photoshop, that's hundreds of dollars. Um, WordPress software to make your website is free. It's not totally free to put your website out on the internet. It's not free to stake your claim on the internet. That's another discussion for later. But WordPress itself to make a website is free. Guess what? I teach a class on beginning WordPress. I can talk about my other classes a little bit later. But this is a WordPress site full of great photography to make you hungry. Hopefully I'm making you hungry so you can go visit. They've got two locations, Los Angeles, San Diego, and Tijuana. And um, right at the top, we've got um, the main purpose of the site, order online, book a table. So the purpose of this site is to make you hungry and have you buy food. Nothing wrong with that. That's capitalism. That's commerce. So the purpose of this website is to sell tacos, basically. Every technique, then, is employed to bring traffic to the website, to entice people, to see are they open, to call, to book a table, to follow on Twitter, etc. Well, who cares? Why, why, why is Twitter important here, or Facebook, or any social media? In short, all of the social media is a marketing platform. It's advertising. It's to reach an audience, especially an audience that cares about your product. So think about when you go to your mailbox, uh, the real mailbox, not your, not your inbox, the real mailbox, and you take out your, your, your mail, and some of it is bills, and some of it is junk mail and such, uh, you might get that uh, Bed Bath & Beyond coupon that we all get, 20% off. If you're lucky, $5 off. And so I get that 20% coupon. My mom gets that 20% off coupon. When I get it, I put it right in the recycle bin. I don't care. When my mom gets it, she takes it and, and uses it eventually. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond paid thousands of dollars to, for someone to design that coupon, print that coupon, deliver that coupon, and I threw it away. My mom used it. So the return on investment for Bed Bath & Beyond on me is very low. They spent $1,000, let's say, and got nothing in return. For my mom, they spent $1,000, and my mom went to go use that coupon and, and, and paid the requisite at least $25 to get 20% off, and then some. She spent $120 instead of only $20 to get the coupon. Return on investment was much higher for her than me, but it still costed Bed Bath some amount of money to send me that coupon I didn't look at. 
It doesn't cost anything to tweet. It doesn't cost anything to Facebook, to YouTube, to Instagram. To an audience that cares enough to follow you, to be much more apt to follow through, you can put a coupon on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram. And it's not costing you. Uh, it could cost you time. Time is money, but it's costing you your time and your effort as opposed to tangible dollars, perhaps. And it perhaps is also reaching an audience that really cares. That's the big secret about social media for a business. It's a marketing platform. I teach a class, a two-part class, at this campus for free on social media. Part one starts next Tuesday. 6 p.m. So in that class, depending on the semester, it's between three and five weeks long, depending on the month, one day per week. When, when you take that class, we cover one social network as much as we can per day. So in a three-week class next week, we will cover three networks, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Plus. Um, part one. If you take a part two, we cover some more. YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, some others that I forget. Uh, I haven't done Snapchat yet. That's a little more tricky to teach. It's very new. It's, it's valuable, but it's, it's a little harder to teach at the moment. Um, so sometimes the class is five weeks long because it's a five-week long month, so we cover even more networks. But uh, in that class, we go into detail because, yeah, I heard of Twitter. That's the place where the, where the kids pass around those uh, funny cat pictures and waste their, waste their time all day long instead of doing their homework. Yes, but social media is also has that professional aspect. There's the frivolous, fun, legitimate aspect of social media, and there's the professional, uh, there's the professional legitimate reason as well. Two sides of the same coin of social media like anything, can be used for fun, frivolity, or for, um, for serious and business and such. We can do that for any of these networks, even Snapchat and all of those. So this company, this owner knows that it's valuable to be on these networks because you can, you can follow the link and see that on Twitter there, there's uh, 721 followers that, that care, so when a coupon gets posted they can go buy the coupon retweets and favorites and comments and, and likes and all of that and community basically. Facebook as well. It's got here, well Facebook's a little bit more closed off that we, I might not be able to show you. You have to log in and I'm not going to. So that's going to show you there's, I don't know how many at the moment, 2,000, 3,000 likes or something. 2,000 people, let's say, that really care about the company enough to follow them so that when the company posts something new, they pay attention and do something about it. The return on investment then could be higher because it's people that really care about your Instagram and follow along. Instead of just sending that Bed Bath & Beyond coupon to everyone in the zip code, it's like sending it directly to the people that care about most, to these 441 followers. When we post this and entices them, and 23 favorites out of some amount out of those are gonna are gonna remember it. Yeah, I'm hungry. I want a nice warm soup on this cold day. And they go to the restaurant. Um, they see that there's new beers at the restaurant. Let me go buy one. They see the events and the fame. This this chef shooting her shooting her um, latest episode at the restaurant. So social media, SEM, that's another aspect of SEO. Um, the website designed in WordPress, that's another class that I teach. There's a blog here. If you scroll down, there's a preview. These are the, the latest blog posts. Um, blogging is a highly important factor of, of, of SEO nowadays. Because let's say you and your competitor both created a website. You're both realtors. You both created a website a year ago. But your competitor, at least once a month, publishes a little article about the state of the industry, or a helpful mortgage calculator, or opinions on mortgage rates and such. Your competitor is updating their website, and the search engines look at that. If a website hasn't up been updated in a while, 
they're going to give precedence to the competition <coughs> that is updating it. Because the search engines are going to see that website is serious, that company is serious, they're updating, they're more relevant. And so updating your website can be as simple as once a month writing 100 words in a blog. I teach a class in blogging where we go into much more detail, but think about that. If you can muster enough time once a month to write 100 words on a topic related to your website, that will help your SEO as well. And as I said earlier, there's a lot of pieces of this, and it can be complicated, but it might not be hard. You might think, well, what does a, what does a restaurant need a blog for? The blog can be used for many purposes. I'm going to skip some of the recent posts just to show you. This is a Mexican food restaurant, but it doesn't serve nachos or California burritos or that sort of thing. It serves traditional Mexican lamb barbecue, barbacoa de borrego. So lamb barbecue, not carne asada, but it's lamb, slow-cooked barbecue, Mexico style. And so this blog uh, is about educating people about the food and beverages served. For example, pulque is served here. It's a beverage. This plant looks like a famous plant. Does it look familiar to anyone? Like the what? Like yucca. Like yucca, okay. I was going for the agave plant. They're related, okay. The agave plant. What does the agave plant graduate to? Tequila. Tequila. This plant is the maguey plant, which is related. And this plant graduates to pulque, which is a traditional alcoholic beverage that you can't find in many places at all in San Diego County. This restaurant serves it. So it's one of the beverages, it's an article about it, and earlier when I did that search about my company and it found all of these, all of these, all of these results, this again is why we would blog or be on Twitter and such to put out content that the search engines can find and index so when someone searches for can I buy pulque in San Diego there's an article right here that basically answers that yes at our restaurant and so people could go to the website go to the restaurant buy the pulque and it came from a blog post can you overblog where you get diminishing returns? What if you did it every week or twice a week or once a month? If you do it right, no. If you if you put varied content out on a regular basis, no. Something new as much as possible, then no. But if you're kind of doing the same thing over and over, boring, boring uh, but in a technical sense, repeat content, that's not so good. And in the blogging class, we would go into more detail. Another article here, craft beer and Mexican food, a perfect pair. So this restaurant is big about serving craft beer. San Diego is actually one of the big cities in the U.S. about craft beer. We've got lots of breweries here. There's one like two miles from my house. So this restaurant serves all of these beers. They serve Bud and Coors and all of that Corona, of course, the classics. But they've got all of these craft beer, Hans Omer and such. Um, <coughs> so this article then is talking about the beers that are that are sold here with these keywords of these companies and these and these keywords that people might be searching for, and when someone searches for that with a mixture of certain keywords, this article could appear and could then bring results, traffic to the website. Well, what's the point of being on the website? Order now, book a table, call us. Down here it shows 191 shares on Facebook, 11 on Google+. I don't like that Twitter. Twitter used to show how many shares on Twitter. For some reason they took that away, but that was also dozens of shares. That's people uh, being like cheerleaders for us, marketers for us, for free. Someone read that article, liked it enough to also tell their friends on Facebook. More exposure, more activity. From my blog post. I'm not quite sure about this one. Mm -hmm. So this blog is uh, posting at these little pictures. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking some of the people say that it's more effective to post in a video. Video is more typically effective than 
those kind of, you know, that's a very good point and notice that this company does have a YouTube channel okay. does have a video portion as well so video is an up-and-coming way to help your social media your SEM and your SEO obviously it takes much more effort because a video takes much more effort than an article than a blog post yes if you change a picture is that kind of like making a new blog in the search engine no no it really is more about the content as much of the words as possible. You can swap out pictures every few months or days or whatever and the search engines don't really it doesn't register with them so much. You can add to an existing blog post an extra paragraph that helps because that's 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 a viable thing to do. Take an old article from a year ago maybe something new happened. Update it a bit share it again on Twitter and get new life for it and that does help. So there is a video actually on this one attached to this article. There's this little video that we did about the craft beer. So, so video is, is a valuable thing. It takes much more effort, but actually you can make a video out of a slideshow. Take a bunch of photos, which is what this one is actually. Let me play this one here. Get the volume. This is one of the basic kind of videos that you can make that is pretty effective. I um, don't know what's wrong with my volume. I might not be able to play the audio, but just imagine there's some cool Latin music going on here. So just a 30 second video showing some still pictures with a transition going through. You can see the other ones we've done where they're more complex. But this is something that you can do right out of iMovie or Windows Movie Maker. It's just some still photos, find some music. YouTube gives you thousands of free music tracks that you can use because that's a thorny issue always. Can I use someone's picture? Can I use someone's music? The short answer is no. Uh, copyrights. But YouTube gives you a bunch of free music to use. And this one's got 116 views. There's other ones with 2,000. Like this one up here has 2,000 views, 679 views, and such. And so that's another viable thing. This has got 156 subscribers with thousands of views. Another aspect, YouTube is another kind of social network that you might not have thought of. You might think, well, that's Twitter, that's Facebook. But YouTube, by some measures, is, is the largest, is the second largest search engine and social network behind Facebook because I can go to YouTube and look up how to fix a doorbell I had to do that recently I bought a new place and previous people broke the doorbell somehow so I had to fix my doorbell I looked it up on YouTube directly I didn't go to Google I looked up a video on how to do that on YouTube so if your company is something hands-on you can provide some sort of video on how to do that Obviously, it's not the same as you doing it professionally, but what if you're a realtor and you want to have a 30-second video talking about the state of the market and that sort of thing? That's another way to reach an audience, to engage in SEM. In the social media class that I teach, depending on the amount of time that we have, we cover YouTube, and again, depending on the amount of time, uh, I like to teach one day on creating a video and one day on uploading and optimizing for YouTube because YouTube itself you sh there's a way to engage in SEO on YouTube uh, so when that comes up if, if you take both parts you'll get the full knowledge let's see what else so you can browse the site yourself and, and basically this is an example of practicing what I teach practicing what I preach so my company does this stuff for real. You can look at this and other ones, and I teach this in my various classes. Uh, we'll take a break in a moment, but if you go look at pmdinteractive.com, you can go look at our portfolio and such. There's a blog with free tips and free articles. We sell web design services, but we also give away a few tips and such, and that's a good technique. Give away a little bit to entice people, and then, of course, have the professional aspect that is not for free. 
because there's nothing like a professional doing something. Someone can try to do it themselves and they'll probably do a good job, but a professional will do a better job. Um, any general questions so far? <clears throat> it's 7.30, let's take our first break. We'll be back at 7.40 and I'll give a couple of other handouts and other activities and such. And that'll be at 7.40.